Well, as we continue in our Easter message series called God's Not Dead, we are asking ourselves some of the tough questions about God and about our faith. Now, in week one, we asked the question, how could a good God allow suffering and evil? Remember? And then last week, we asked ourselves the question, is the Bible really a trustworthy resource to understand God's message? This week, we wrestled with the question, was the universe created by God or did it evolve solely by itself? Now, some people today would say that science disproves the existence of God. And as we get started, I just wonder, how would you respond to the question if someone asked you, doesn't science and faith contradict one another? Now, contrary to what some people say, our faith in God is not blind. Uh, and I'm loving this message series we're in because it's showing us that, that our faith is not blind. Over the years, I've heard well-intentioned Christians say that to be a Christian, you must take a blind leap of faith into the dark when it comes to accepting God's existence and his salvation. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, in my earlier days as a Christian, I, I believed that as well. In fact, I remember someone explaining faith to me like this. They said, say you are a child and you wake up one night and you are on the second floor in your bedroom and you smell smoke and you feel the heat of flames. And so you try to escape by running down the stairs. But when you get to the stairs, there's fire and flames and you, you're trapped. You can't get down that way. So what do you do next? You run back to your bedroom and you open up the window hoping to escape and you're getting ready to jump. But then you're thinking, if I jump from the second story, I'm going to break my neck and I am going to die. Plus, I can't even see anything because there's just smoke billowing out of those first floor windows and it's dark and all I see is smoke. And so as you are standing there, suddenly you hear your dad's voice shouting up to you, Jump, Tyler, I'll catch you. But I jump, I, I yell back, I can't jump. I can't even see you, and I don't know for sure if you're going to catch me. But he responds, I know you can't see me. Just jump, because I can see you. I will catch you, and you will be saved. And so, of course, the moral of the story, as it's told to me, is we now have a choice, right? Either jump into the dark and be slaved by blind faith or perish because of a lack of faith that your father sees you and can catch you. And of course, this whole story is a metaphor about us and about God and how we are to take that blind leap of faith into the arms of a loving heavenly father who sees you. Now, I'd like for us to consider that metaphor maybe a little bit differently today than how we are used to hearing it. I would suggest to you that such a leap of faith into the loving Father's arms is not blind, but it is based on evidence. And while it is true that you have to eventually choose whether or not you are going to believe in God or not, it is not based on blind faith, but it is based on faith that is informed. Consider again the story I just told about this little boy jumping into his father's arms, and why such an action is not totally blind. For one thing, the boy recognizes he's in a pickle, doesn't he? I mean, there's flames and there's smoke, and it's a real danger whether you are comparing that to our life right now or whether you are comparing that to uh, eternal life and, and hell and how some people are going to end up there. And we know that our lives in this world can get really messed up really quickly. Also, even though this boy can't see his father below, he can hear him, right? He, he can hear his voice. Maybe even though he can't see the fire trucks and the police cars because of all the smoke and the darkness, he probably can see that light kind of in a blurry way as those flashers are going and everything. And so uh, th there is this idea that... Uh, he can sense there is somebody there who wants to save him. And there is a father that he hears who wants to rescue him. There is evidence that his dad is there even though he cannot directly see him. And so as we answer this question, 
Was the universe created or evolved? I would propose to you that there is evidence for God's existence and that it can be seen in the design of our universe and in all of creation. More than that, even though we can't see God directly right now, this evidence points to a creator God who loves you and desires to rescue you from all that has gone wrong in this life. I want us to consider three things this morning. First, consider this. The universe indicates that it has a sovereign cause behind its creation. Now, because there is an orderliness to the universe, it is reasonable to conclude that someone of immense intelligence, someone of immense power, put it all in place. This is not an unreasonable thought. The universe is a powerful pointer to the existence of God. Not only is it big, not only is it beautiful, but all of its parts work together well. The very existence of the universe raises the question, how did this get here? Answering that question leads you to a creator or a designer. Think about it. If nothing existed, you wouldn't even have to explain it. It would be a moot question. But the moment something exists, it raises the question, how did this get here? Where did it come from? The obvious answer is it came from something else. Animals come from their parents. Flowers come from seeds. Houses come from a builder. Cars come from a factory. Everything comes from something else. It, if I had a can of Lincoln Logs, oh, look. This just happened to show up here. A can of Lincoln Logs. It just showed up by itself. Well, maybe not. But if I had a can of Lincoln Logs and I started shaking this can from here until eternity, do you think that a log cabin would ever develop and and form in there? I guarantee you it wouldn't. And uh, I, I know this from experience because when I was a kid growing up, I had Lincoln Logs. It wasn't a little different kind of a canister, but nonetheless, it was Lincoln Logs. And, and I, uh, when I would come into a room and I would see a log cabin there built on the floor, I knew that somebody designed that. I knew that somebody built it and put it there. And, you know, there were plenty of times when those Lincoln logs would get tossed across the room, sometimes at incredible speeds at my siblings' heads. And, <laughs> and I'm telling you, it, they never formed into a log cabin on their own. Never. When it comes to the universe and the existence and orderliness of it, it is all contingent on something that came before it. What's more, everything is dependent on something else for its existence and its sustenance. Humans depend on food to live. Plants depend on the sun for photosynthesis to take place. The sun depends on gravity to keep it from just exploding apart. And so everything in the universe has come to depend on something else for its sustenance. It is dependent on something else in order for it to keep going. And so if you push all the way back into history, the history of the universe, and you ask yourself, where did all this stuff come from? The answer must point to something that is beyond it. Okay? It was created by something else, and it depends on something else that is uncreated, that is independent of the universe. Now, another way of of looking at it is to say that the something which created the universe must be eternal and self-sufficient. And the only being that fits such a description is who? God. God himself. And so we read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning, God created the what? The heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. George Lemaitre, a Belgian astronomer, he says that the entire universe jumping into existence in a trillionth of the trillionth of a second out of nothingness in an unimaginably intense flash of light is how we would expect the universe to respond if God were to actually utter the command of Genesis 1-3, let there be light. You know, I got to thinking about that. It's like, I don't know what that sounds like to you, but to me that sounds an awful lot like the Big Bang. 
Let there be light. And they all came into existence. Everything in the universe has been expanding and getting farther and farther apart from that point of the Big Bang ever since to this very day. Now, the Bible doesn't call it the Big Bang, right? That's a term that science has given to describe that moment when matter exploded, sending out galaxies and quasars and comets and stars and suns and planets. Science calls it the Big Bang. The Bible calls it, and God said, let there be light. They are describing the same thing, the creation of the universe. Now, someone who is skeptical of God's existence is going to say, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, I don't see God in any direct physical kind of way, and because I can't see him, I refuse to believe that he exists. I will not believe in him. But as Rice Brooks brings out in the God's Not Dead study guide that we're reading on Sunday nights in our life group, he says we shouldn't demand to directly find God physically in creation any more than we should demand to find Steve Jobs inside of an iPhone. <laughs> he says what we see when we look at an iPhone is not Steve Jobs, but rather the design and the orderliness that gives a clear picture of his creativity and ingenuity as its designer. Because the universe has not always existed. And science agrees with that. Stephen Hawking, in fact, he writes, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Because the universe has not always existed, it therefore must have come from something that is independent of creation and non-dependent on it. And what do we read in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4? This is what we read. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day by day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Now the Bible isn't saying that the universe literally talks to us. But it is saying that God communicates to us in part through what he has made and through what we see in our universe. It's as if God is saying, I am here, I exist, look at all this, I made it. And every year, you know what? We see more and we learn more about the universe. When you go home, go to your computer and Google Hubble Telescope. And you will be amazed at all of the fantastic pictures that are coming from our universe. Uh, and, and, and behind that is the source of creation, the sovereign cause. We call him God. Well, there is a second consideration in light of the evidence that points to a creator God who loves you, who desires to rescue you from all that has gone wrong with life as we know it. Number two, our world reveals an orderliness that requires a creative, intelligent designer. <clears throat> if you look at our world, you can tell a lot about our creator by what he created. In other words, the design reflects its designer. Chart the path of the stars. Measure the decay rate of an atom. Examine the laws of physics. Everything you study is well-ordered, and it is precise, and it is complex. Stare up at the night sky. Look at the stars. Walk along the beach at sunset. Put a snowflake underneath a microscope. Everywhere you look, our world is saturated with beauty and intricacy. All of these things not only point to a creator, but they also point to the nature of of this creator. He's ingenious. He's beautiful. He is detailed. The beauty and complexity of the universe and the world that we live in, it all points to God. But it also hints at what kind of God he must be. Plato, the philosopher, he believed that it was reasonable to believe in God based on, as he puts it, the order of the motion of the stars and all the things under the dominion of the mind which ordered the universe. Sir Isaac Newton, he said, when I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. And he's right. But what do we see when we look at the details of our own world in which we live? 
I want to consider just one example this morning, just one example. In 2011, engineers at Intel, the computer chip manufacturer, <clears throat> they built a robotic music machine they called the Intel Industrial Control in Concert. It's inspired by a computer animated music video called Pipe Dream, but this Intel music machine creates high-tech syncopated music by firing rubber paintballs from a sensor equipped computer operated system to create a song that has 2,372 notes. In fact, I showed this video probably two or three years ago, but I thought it fits in so well with what we're looking at right now. I wanted to go ahead and show this, this video again. So Matt, if you'd go ahead and roll it, check this out. How cool is that? Honey, I want one of those. Can we get one of those? <laughs> that, that's fun, isn't it? I mean, what, a, what an entertaining piece of music all tied into computers and perfect timing. I love how at the end of the video it says, powering intelligent systems for the connected world. We know that that thing didn't just throw itself together out of the blue, right? I mean, as I got to thinking about all of its complexity and the equipment and the computers and the instruments, along with all the precise movements and the timing that it required, I can't help but be impressed by the creativity and the intelligence of the minds who designed it. Everything works so well together. It's perfect. It's beautiful. Now, think about the complexity of our world and the precision with which everything has to work in order for life to exist on planet Earth. Just as that Intel music machine, a, a much less complex system in comparison to our world, just as it required intelligence and creativity in its creation, how much more so intelligence is needed for designing the complexity and the preciseness of our world's workings and the life it contains. And as I've mentioned, you know, some people say that science has disproven the existence of God, but I think it's quite the opposite. 
The discoveries of science affirm more than ever before that God exists, that he is the intelligence behind the creation of the universe and life on our planet. And here's the one thing that I want us to consider this morning in this regard. In 1953, Francis Crick and James Watson discovered something. Do you know who, what they discovered? They discovered the now famous double helix of DNA. Uh, Crick and Watson. And DNA is formed by the pairing of two of the four nucleotides found in DNA. And it processes the use of protein and it arranges the information so, so precisely that that information can then be meaningful. At much like a computer programming language, your DNA contains thousands upon thousands of commands and codes that instruct your cells how to build proteins, when to build proteins, how many of these proteins to build, and what to do with them. It is these computer-like instructions that make all living organisms possible. Now, the average human body contains 100 trillion cells, each cell containing its own strand of DNA. If you unravel the DNA in just one of those cells, it would be an average of nine feet in length. If you aligned all the DNA in your body, it would go from here to the sun and back 70 times. Okay, as for the information DNA stores, scientists tell us the DNA in one cell has the equivalent of 8 billion letters or 500 million words or 8,000 books. I'd like to have that library. Actually, multiply that by 100 trillion, and that's a lot of information, all contained in this beautiful body. <laughs> no wonder King David proclaims in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, you created my inmost being. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This raises an interesting question for atheists. Where does this information come from? Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, he says the answer to that question is luck. He says it was by chance that all of this came together. But there are other scientists and philosophers who've considered this question, and they say that there is so much information in DNA that it is there is no way that it could have just possibly come together by itself by chance. In fact, San Francisco State University professor of biology, Dean Kenyon, he says that a better explanation for DNA and all of its information is that an intelligence called God is behind it. Now think about it. Where in our experience does language and information and programming code and systems come from? In our experience, they only come from intelligence, never by chance. At the end of the day, after weighing the evidence from science of just one thing in our world, DNA, one can come to a reasonable conclusion that there is an orderliness to our world that comes from a creative, intelligent designer. And the Bible calls this designer God. That leads to a third consideration in light of the evidence that points to creative, creator God who loves you and desires to rescue you from all that has gone wrong in life as we know it. Third, only life can beget life. Regardless of your opinion about evolution, everyone recognizes that it only explains what happens after life has occurred. It can't explain how that first cell ever originated. Now, according to Rice Brooks in his book, God's Not Dead, the probability of a cell spontaneously forming on the early earth is one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. That is a number represented by a one with 40,000 zeros behind it. It would fill a small book. That probability, he says, is comparable to the chances of a tornado moving through a junkyard and assembling a fully operational 747 jet airplane. You think that's going to happen? No. Most scientists recognize that a cell never originated by chance. And yet, some believe that somehow the laws of nature spontaneously brought together all these different building blocks to form the first cell so that life could begin. 
In other words, they argue that humans and all of our component parts are the result of a long evolutionary development that began when life arose spontaneously from non-living chemicals. From this perspective, as Terry Cheney puts it in a book called A Humble Defense, he says, a man is considered to be the culmination of a long ancestry of less sophisticated and less intelligent creatures, but is that how nature operates? It doesn't. It never does. In fact, the French scientist Louis Pasteur, he demonstrated to the larger scientific community that life never arises spontaneously from non-living material. Before Pasteur's work, Many people believed that worms, for example, were the end result of horse hairs that had fallen into the mud and then they somehow came to life and became worms. That's what they used to believe. They also used to believe, for ex another example, that maggots were the byproducts of rotting meat. But life doesn't come from dead or inanimate compounds or elements. It never has, it never will. The way nature operates is that it moves from a state of being in order to a state of disorder. This principle is called the second law of thermodynamics. And if I don't intentionally keep things picked up and cleaned in my office, for instance, it very quickly goes from a state of order to disorder, right? Or if I don't keep the weeds pulled out of my flower gardens and landscaping, and if I don't keep the, the bushes trimmed and things pruned, then very quickly it'll move from a state of order to disorder. If you own a pool, you know how quickly a pool can go from being clean and in proper working order to just becoming a mess. Things typically become messy and chaotic when left to themselves. They don't pull themselves together on their own automatically. But not only that. Nature tends to move from high energy to low energy. Water always runs downhill, right? It never runs uphill. Or if I don't wind up my clock periodically or replace the battery in my watch, it winds down or the battery's energy is eventually drained and the clock or the watch stops working. But a cell, however, is both highly ordered and contains very high energy compared to all its separate building blocks. And so as Rice Brooks points out, for simple chemicals to come together to form a cell, nature would need to act in the opposite direction of its normal course. Much like a messy room spontaneously becoming well organized during an earthquake. Not going to happen, is it? or a battery becoming charged on its own as time goes on without it ever being connected to a charger. Nature doesn't happen that way. Life doesn't originate from non-life. Rather, non-life originates from the creator of life. And so we read in Psalm 139, verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Or we read in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. And in Genesis 2, 7, The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Only life can beget life. And so it is no surprise that as we turn to Jesus for eternal life at the end of time, he is the giver of life, and we recognize that. Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead by chance or happenstance. He rose from death by the power of God, who is the giver of life. And scripture tells us, Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being. When we look at this universe, when we look around at our world, when we consider the fact that only life can give life, we see that none of what we observe of our experience could have just happened by random combinations of particles coming together through endless amounts of time. When it comes to addressing the question, was the universe created or evolved? I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of why so many scientists have changed their minds over the last 30 years about the universe not reasonably being explained by a cosmic accident. Look at the details and the design of the human eye. And it quickly becomes obvious that it could not have evolved in a piecemeal fashion. 
No, it was designed and created fully by God. Consider the nuclear force that holds the basic compounds and components of atoms together. Or consider the perfect strength of gravity. Or consider the mass of a neutron in proportion to the proton. Or consider the distance of the earth from the sun. Or the fact that Jupiter benefits us and that's why it's in our solar system. Consider the fact of the earth's tilt or photosynthesis in plants. You start looking into those details, I could go on and on and on. And then all of a sudden you see these things require an intelligent creator putting them all together. That's not to take away from the benefits of science. We know that science is discovering and doing amazing things that we benefit from. The question is, where does the universe and life originate giving us purpose in our life? You see, the universe and life originates in God. There must be some creative agent to explain the creative design of life that is in us and all around us. No wonder every human soul strongly desires to know God across continents, across cultures, to, and desires to put their hope in something beyond where we live right now. Is this not the result of our being created in God's image as stated in Genesis 1.27? Physics, design, biology, it all points to the creator God in whose image we are made, the God of the Bible. It takes more faith, in fact, to believe that there is not a God than to believe that there is one. As the Apostle Paul states in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. God is alive. He loves you very much. And when your world is falling apart, he wants to help you put it all back together again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. For this beautiful universe and world that you've given us in which to live, may we listen to its testimony. And may we listen to your revelation brought out in your word as we try to put all this together and make some sense of it. We thank you, God, for calling us together as your people, that we can have purpose in life, that we can know that there is more to life than what we see and experience right now that one day we will be in your very presence and it will all make more sense than we ever thought or dreamed or imagined. God, may we go forth this day with your blessing and your favor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.